Good morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. I want to say thank you for being here today. As you know, today, uh, this weekend, rather tomorrow, we'll celebrate Memorial Day. So I I trust that uh, uh, you will use that time to reflect and to remember uh, those who have died while serving our United States military. Um, That gives us the freedom today to assemble It gives us the freedom of speech, and it gives us the freedom of religion. So these three freedoms and these three protections are given to us by those who have served in the military and given their lives. So I hope that in your fun this weekend, you'll remember uh, those who have uh, given their lives in sacrifice for your freedoms. Well, welcome to Grace Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. If you have a bulletin, I want you to take it out and look inside. I want to point out a few things today about our service. A few things today. In just a few moments, Don will come and he will read for us today our morning reading. Our morning reading will be Psalm chapter 119, verses 153 through 160. So if you have your Bible and you want to go ahead and turn to Psalm 119 and find those verses... Don will come in just a few moments and read those to us as our morning reading. Uh, As you know, we pray for other churches in our community each and every week, and this week is no different. Uh, This week, we're going to pray for a great named church, Jesus is the Way Church. (laughs) What a great name for a church. Uh, But uh, we're going to pray for Jesus is the Way Church this this week. Uh, This church is located downtown. And so we'll pray for this church and also for the pastor and for the ministry of the word there. Uh, Joby's playing for us today. We're very grateful. Heather's going to lead us today. I know a lot of people are out because of uh, the holiday and they're traveling and such, so we will pray for them in their absence. Today we'll continue our study of Mark's gospel. So Mark chapter 6, 7, and 8. We will explore that together this morning. On the inside of your bulletin, there's two things I want you to notice. The first thing is the weekly reading. As you probably remember, we're going through 10 books of the Bible this year. And one of those books is the book of Mark, and we're right in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. And so on Sunday, like today, you have the readings for this coming week. Our Wednesday night study will be about these readings, and next Sunday's sermon, Lord willing, will be on this these passages as well. So this week as you're reading eight chapters 8 through 10, uh, focus in on that reading and then come on Wednesday nights or this Wednesday night and then next Sunday because we'll explore this passage together. One other thing I want you to note is uh, question 104. Question 104. And the question this week is relative to the fifth commandment. What is God's will for you in the fifth commandment? What is God's will for you? Well, God's will is that I honor, love, and be loyal to my father and mother and all those in authority over me, that I submit myself with proper obedience to all their good teaching and discipline, and also that I be patient with their failings, for through them God chooses to rule us. And that is the sum total of the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. You have the verses there. 
And I know all of you parents will rush to teach that one at least this week. Yes? Yes. Good. Okay, well, let's pray together. And uh, after we pray and open our service, Don will come and read from Psalm 119. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. And thank you for time, the time that you've created. Enable us to make good use of it on this Lord's day and each day that you give us. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the deceitfulness of sin in us and the deceitful of sin around us. Grant us grace to persevere in faith in hope, and in love. Focus our hearts today on purity and truth. And we pray that you would bless our friends at the Jesus is the Way Church. Open their eyes to see wonderful things in your word and grow them in your grace and in the knowledge of your Son, the Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. morning, Grace Baptist. Happy Memorial Day to everyone. <clears throat> As Kevin said, we'll be in Psalm 119. If you'll turn, we'll be reading verses 153 through 160. Hear God's word. Look upon my affliction and rescue me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your ordinances. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I do not turn aside from your testimonies. I behold the treacherous and loathe them, because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. May we pray. Lord, we do thank you for this morning. Please um, be with us as we hear uh, the words from Mark. Lord, speak through Kevin and make his speech clear to us, and God, soften our hearts to hear. Thank you again for this service. And these prayers are said in Jesus' name. Amen.
two, and three. To God be the glory, great things he had done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done O perfect redemption the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest offender who truly Jesus paid it all. We'll sing verse 1, 2, and 4. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe. Sin had left a 
crimson stain He washed it white as snow Thank you. You may be seated. Well, I hope that you have uh, your Bible with you. If you do, please take it out and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. And I want you to turn with me to chapter 7. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. And I'll begin reading in verse 14. Chapter 7, verse 14. And I'll read through verse 23. Mark chapter 7, uh, verses 14 through 23. Now, as you're turning there... To Mark 7, there are three words that I want to give you this morning, and these three words will guide us as we meditate on Mark 6, 7, and 8. So here are the three words. The first word is the word illusion, illusion. The second word is the word tradition, tradition, and the third word is the word familiar, Familiar. So, illusion, tradition, and familiar. Let's pray together this morning, ask the Lord to bless the reading of His Word, and then I'll read chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. Let's pray. Father, incline our hearts to Your Word, to its truth. Open our eyes to see it. Open our hearts to believe it. Unite our hearts to fear you, to trust you, to turn away from our own understanding and to embrace and to accept what you have laid out for us in your word. Bless the reading of your word in these moments. Take the benefits of it and multiply them to us. That's our prayer. And we make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 7, verse 14, this is God's Word. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, the disciples asked about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Then he declared, All foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. Amen and amen. May God bless the reading of his word, and may he add his benefit to our meditation on it on this Lord's day. Well, I trust that you have read Mark 6, 7, and 8. Amen. No? Uh Uh-oh. Well, if you have read this, or even if you haven't read this, you know that Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark to the Roman people. And there is primarily one main concern in the Roman people. And that is the word authority. That's how they operate their lives. 
Who is in authority? Who is in charge? And so Mark writes this gospel about Jesus and about his works and his words to address the issue of authority. So before we begin, I want to ask you this question. By what authority do you live your life? What is the authority that guides you? Perhaps governs you? Another way we could ask that is, how do you make decisions? And how is it that you go about making those decisions? See, all of those questions can be addressed here in Mark 6, 7, and 8. Because all of us in this room have an authority. That authority could be the Scriptures. That authority could be our traditions. That authority could be our experiences. That authority could be a host of things. But there is an authoritative mechanism in your life that's guiding you as you make these decisions. Whether you've ever considered it or not, it's always been there. At this point, I want to call your attention to something that Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Solomon says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And then the opposite of that is do not lean on your own understanding. He perfectly framed authority for us in chapter 3, verse 5. It is either trust the Lord or it is lean on our own understanding. In Mark chapter 6, 7, and 8, Mark emphasizes the compassion of Jesus. Jesus healed multiple people and Demonstrated his authority over creation in multiple ways here, but his compassion magnifies the hardness of the human heart. The people with whom Jesus interacted in chapter 6, 7, and 8 couldn't see Jesus for who Jesus was and is, primarily because of themselves. Secondarily, because of their traditions. And thirdly, because of their familiarity with Jesus. So let's break this apart together. The first word is the word illusion. Illusion. All of us live under an illusion until we come to faith in Christ. What is the illusion of? It's the illusion of self. As Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on whose understanding? Your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your understanding. So we all, by nature and by birth and even by choice, live under an illusion. If you notice in chapter 6, Verse number 12, as Jesus is sending out his disciples, verse number 12 says, So they went out and proclaimed that people should, what? Repent. Repent of what? Repent of self-centeredness. Repent of self-absorption. Do you know who the real problem is in your life? <laughs> it's not your husband, it's not your wife, it's not your children, it certainly is not your preacher. Well, I don't know, your preacher may be your problem in your life. It's the person that stares at you in the, win in the mirror. That's your greatest challenge in life, is self we have this way about us as humans. We go about our lives 
creating ways to establish ourselves before God. And in the process of creating these ways to establish ourselves before God, we then begin to trust what we've created to commend us to God. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down Romans chapter 1 verse 25. Romans chapter 1 verse 25. Paul says in Romans 1.25, they, that's humanity, they have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So just imagine this. Humans, that's us. We take the truth of God and we exchange it for a lie. That sounds a lot like Proverbs 3.5, doesn't it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. But we take the truth about God, we exchange it for a lie, and subsequently we take the lie and we serve and worship the lie. If you're also taking notes, I want you to write down next to Romans chapter 1 verse 25, I want you to write down Romans chapter 10 verses 3 and 4, and I want you to hear these words as I read them, Romans 10, 3 and 4. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own. Did you hear it? They do not submit to God's righteousness because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. So in Romans 1.25, we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And subsequently, we serve and worship the lie because we think that the lie establishes us before God. And the reason we think that lies establish us before God, namely the lie that I can do something to get right with God. Is my microphone on? That's a lie. Churches perpetuate that lie quite frequently that I can do something to commend myself to God or I can do something that can make myself right with God or I can do something that would outweigh the bad that is in my life. That is a lie. Because if it were true, then Jesus died for no reason. Do you think that, G that God the Father killed His Son as a sacrifice for no reason? The life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus stand as the emblem, the symbol, the sign, if you will, that you and I cannot do enough to commend ourselves to God. And yet, we exchange the truth about God, which is the gospel of grace, that Jesus paid it all, that Jesus did it all. We exchange that truth for a lie, which says, I can now do something that commends me to God. And why do we do this? Because we're ignorant of the righteousness of God. And so we try to establish our own righteousness. Do you see the illusion there? It's deception, beloved. It's self-deception. We deceive ourselves into thinking this. And why is it at all that we want to be commended to God? Because deep down, we know that we're guilty. Whether you're a Christian this morning or not a Christian is really beside the point. Part of the human condition is the experience of guilt. What is guilt? Guilt is the feeling of exposure. Light exposes Darkness. And if light shines into darkness, darkness runs. That's how we feel. We feel exposed and uncovered. This is not new with you and me though. This is the experience of our first parents in the Garden of Eden. 
after they had fallen, they had sinned against God and rebelled against Him, the Scripture says that God comes walking through the garden and says, Hey Adam, where are you? Well, He's hiding. Why is He hiding? Because at that moment He knows He's exposed. He knows He's uncovered. The biblical word for that is naked. And since Adam, until now, you feel naked too. That's what guilt is. It's a sense of being exposed. And because all of us have that, whether we're believers or non-believers, whether you're a Baptist or whether you're Methodist, whether you're agnostic or an atheist, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. You're a human. You're never going to be non-human. And part of the human experience is this experience. Feeling guilt and feeling shame. Feeling exposed. Feeling uncovered. And so being ignorant then of God's righteousness in Christ, what do we do? We try to establish our righteousness. And what are we really doing? We're trying to cover ourselves. We're trying to keep the exposure of ourselves to a minimum. This is an illusion. Because God sees you exactly how you are, beloved. There was a, a famous theologian, he very good writer. I commend his books to you. His name is J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer is, is dead and gone home now. But J.I. Packer said something once in one of his books that has forever marred me in a good way. He says that God justifies you with His eyes wide open. Beloved, the illusion that you have is that you can cover yourself. The illusion that you have is that somehow you can keep your exposure limited because of that guilt and that shame of, of feeling. So instead of coming to Christ and being covered by Christ, having your sin and guilt, which is exposed, covered in Christ, you exchange the truth for a lie. And you try to establish yourself by the things you do religiously. In chapter 6, verse 12 of Mark, Jesus sends out His disciples to proclaim that people should repent. Now usually when we use the word repent, the preacher's got really a red face, right? And he's kind of spitting as he's yelling, and he's kind of slamming his, you know, repent, you know, turn or burn. You've heard the sermon. I knew it. How about this one? Sanctified or French fried. Yes, yes. Yes, you've heard all of that. Beloved, that's not what repentance is. Repentance is seeing your guilt and your exposure. It's seeing that you are undone and uncovered. And it is turning from establishing yourself by yourself to Jesus. That's what repentance is. Yes, it includes grief over what you used to be, but it also includes joy in what Christ is. Do you see? But the illusion of self is what prevents us from seeing Christ. We all, by nature, seek security. Would you agree with that? We say we want job security. We want financial security. We want marital security. We typically gravitate toward people and things that make us feel secure. Have you ever wondered why we need security so bad? Because we're insecure. Why are we insecure? Because of our guilt. Because we're exposed. Because of our shame. Because we're uncovered. And the illusion that I want you to recognize this morning 
is that in those moments of insecurity and instability emotionally, spiritually, in those moments, repenting is turning from establishing yourself and your righteousness through the things you do to Jesus. As you come to Jesus and you find in Jesus the security that you indeed want and that you can find nowhere else. We want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We want to feel valuable. And so we create ways in our lives to feel these things. We use vocation. We use money. We use academics. We use relationships. We use these things to establish ourselves and to prove to ourselves and to prove to others that we're okay. But beloved, we're not okay. And it's okay to not be okay. Because God demonstrated His love for those who while we were sinners, He died for us. It's okay to not be okay. And while you're not okay, you come to Jesus. The illusion of self prevents you from coming to Jesus. In chapter 6, verse 7, I want you to notice what he says. He says he called the, the twelve and he began to send them out two by two. And he gave authority over these unclean spirits. In chapter 3, verse 14, you see the same thing. He calls together his disciples and he sends them out to preach. And what are they to preach? They are to preach about this deceptive appearance, this illusion of self. They are to preach the, the false ideas and to highlight those false ideas from which people should repent. Yes, they preach the gospel, but while they're preaching the gospel, that by nature affects and highlights all false beliefs. And as God shines the light on those false beliefs, a person can then see by the help and aid and grace of the Holy Spirit that they are deluded. And they've believed in a lie, namely the illusion of self and self-righteousness. And they can then repent and turn to Christ by faith. As they were preaching in chapter 6 verse 7 and chapter 3 verse 14, they were preaching that they need to recognize, that people need to recognize their personal unbelief toward Jesus. May I say to you today, every one of you in this room, I have no doubt, every one of you in this room is a believer. But you just may not be a believer of the gospel. You see, all people believe. The question is, what do you believe? Do you believe the person and work of Jesus for you? Or do you believe you must do something to earn and to establish yourself? When these apostles were sent out to preach, and mind you, he's not changed his charge to preachers, <laughs> it's still the same mandate. These apostles and any preacher after the apostles had to preach to people so that they could recognize their personal unbelief toward Jesus. And they could realize the love of God toward them in spite of them. Did you hear it? This is what they preached. And for them to turn to Christ to satisfy their sin and to secure them before God. The people then and the people now must repent. We must repent. 
We must turn from the object that we trust, the object to which we are committed, and let me let you in on the object so there's no ambiguity, there's no confusion. The object that we trust by nature, by choice, is self. We lean on our own understanding and then we go to churches that don't preach the gospel and we lean on our own religious understanding. The second thing that you see here beside self is the word tradition. Jesus addressed the hardness of their heart primarily because of the illusion of self, but secondarily because of the tradition of security. Yet again, yet again, we come back to that word, security. This is what every human being wants. Me, you, all. And in order to get that security... People turn to religious traditions and religious practices so they can feel secure. This goes back to the illusion of self. The illusion of self doing something to make me feel secure. Have you ever noticed about those individuals who are not looking to Christ for security, but they look to what they do for security. Have you ever noticed that those people typically think that they're superior to you? Yes, no, maybe so. When a person looks at Christ, they know, when they look at Christ for security, they know they're not superior to anyone. Because Christ doesn't die for righteous people, He dies for unrighteous people. Christ doesn't die for perfect people, He dies for imperfect people. Christ dies for sinners. So when a sinner looks at Christ and finds in Christ security, that sinner cannot look at other people and feel superior. It's just one beggar telling other beggars where to find bread. But when people don't believe the gospel and rather believe their religious traditions or their experiences to feel that sense of security, the sense of superiority overwhelms them and they look at people who don't do what they do and they look down on them. Don't stop me when I'm preaching good. This is the epitome of hypocrisy. This is the epitome of being a Pharisee. It is following my traditions that I believe commend me to God and thus make me feel secure. And while I'm doing real good with what I think I need to do, all the while rebelling against and rejecting the gospel of grace, I feel superior to those that are not as good as me doing religious things like me. God help. Look in chapter 7, verse 5. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, there's this story tucked right here in the middle about this very thing traditions. In chapter 7, verse 5, notice how Mark writes. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Notice chapter 7 verses 8 and 9. Jesus says, You leave. Do you underline in your Bible? Underline the word leave. He says, You leave the commandment of God and you hold that's committed. That's what that means. Hold on to. You're committed to. You leave the commandment of God and you hold to the traditions of man. The two choices here is, do I listen to and trust the command of God, which by the way is love, or do I hold to and commit myself to the traditions of men? 
I wish I had a lot longer than I do to really unpack that. Because part of your responsibility as a church member, I'll give you this as a side note. Part of your responsibility as a church member is to discern whether or not me or whoever's standing here is giving you the command of God or the traditions of men. So whether you're here, there, or yonder, it doesn't matter. If there's a pulpit and a steeple and you're sitting there, it's incumbent upon you to be discerning. To listen. Is this gentleman telling me the command of God, which is to love my neighbor as myself, or is he telling me some tradition for me to follow, and by following that tradition, I'll feel good about myself, I'll feel secure with my standing with God, and thus I'll look down on others. You have to discern that. If you notice verse 13, chapter 7, verse 13, notice what following the traditions of men does. Thus making the word of God void by the traditions that were handed down to you. What is a tradition? It seems to be the problem Jesus is addressing here. Would you agree with that? In verse 5, and verse 8, and verse 9, verse 13, he's addressing this, this idea of tradition. And these are the religious people holding these traditions. So what is a tradition? A tradition is a religious action or activity that one performs. My God, help. A religious action or activity that one performs to make oneself feel secure. You notice we keep coming back to that theme, secure. Have you noticed that? And why is it? Because none of us feel secure. Because we're fallen. We were born after Genesis 3. We feel exposed. We feel uncovered. And we're striving our entire lives for covering, for security, to minimize exposure. So some people gravitate toward religious traditions to cover them. Or religious experiences to cover them. Verse 13 here says, you make the word of God void. By your traditions that were handed down to you. Now, what exactly is this talking about? Well, the Old Testament here is a reference to Moses. Okay, So the Word of God, I should say, not the Old Testament. The Word of God here, when he says, you made the Word of God void, he's talking about Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Now, something that you may or may not know is that between the book of Malachi and the advent of Christ was approximately 400 years. During that period of time... You had four religious groups that rose to power. One's the Pharisees, two's the Sadducees, third's the Essenes, fourth is the Zealots. During that 400 400 years of God's silence, God didn't speak from Malachi to Matthew. All those blank pages, (laughs) there was no new revelation. Men couldn't take it. So in the absence of new revelation, guess what these men did? They created New revelation. They wrote commentaries on Moses. And those commentaries, what men wrote about Moses, became just as authoritative as Moses himself. Now before we look at them and say, well, that's them. Well, no, no, it's you too. It's you too. Because you take the Word of God that you don't know very well And you say, well, Brother Kevin says this about the Bible. Or you say, um, so-and-so on TV, or so-and-so on the internet, or so-and-so on the podcast, or so-and-so in the commentary, or so-and-so in the book, or so-and-so, blah, 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 whatever. They said this about the Bible, therefore this is what I hold. It's the same thing we do today, you see. A moment ago I said to you, we all operate by an authority. We're all governed by it. We make a decision by it. It's either the word of God or it's the traditions of men. 
And Jesus is very critical here of this, this issue. Because these religious people are appealing to contrasting authorities. Is it the word of God or is it the traditions of men? You pick. That's what Jesus is saying in this uh, slow southern vernacular that we have. You choose. Because here, here's the issue before us. All people. Yes, I know that's a big word. All people have the sense of the divine upon their life. The reformers called it the sensus divinatus. Which means that all of us have a sense of the divine on us. And we're all asking this question. It may be confusing and it may be ambiguous, but deep down we're made in the image of God. That image is marred and blurred through our sin, but deep down the sense of the divine is on us. You cannot escape it. And we're all asking this question, how can I be right with God? Let me give you an illustration of this. You've heard of this thing called atheists, right? Y'all need to get out more. You've never heard of an atheist? Oh, okay. Jeez. I was going to bring one to church next week and show you. <laughs> the word atheist, atheist, it means there's no God. A, you put the word A in front of something, it means it negates it. It's atheist. A theist is a person who believes there's God. An atheist says there's no God. Have you ever noticed why the atheist goes to such great lengths to prove there is no God? Have you ever wondered that? They turn to science to disprove God. They turn to philosophy to disprove God. They're trying to disprove something they say they don't believe. Have you ever considered that? And why would an atheist go to such great lengths to disprove what they don't believe exists? Because the sense of the divine is upon them and they're trying to escape it. And they can't. And by the way, just as a side note, there's no such thing as an atheist. Now that's not because I haven't met them. I've met plenty of atheists, but it's, it's a paradox. Atheists don't exist because to say there is no God means that you have to have a couple things. Number one, you've got to have omniscience, which means you've got to know everything. And there's no human being that knows everything, so you can't say there's no God. Number two, you've got to have omnipresence. You've got to be everywhere at all times to say, well, God's not there. And since you're limited to where you are, you can't say God's not in Africa right now. You can't prove it. There's no such thing as an atheist. But the point here is that whether they're an atheist or a Baptist, and really there's no difference. Because the God of the Baptist and the God of the atheist aren't the real living and true God anyway. Whether they're an atheist, a Baptist, an agnostic, a philosopher, a scientist, or a preacher. It doesn't matter. All people have the sense of the divine upon them. They know they're exposed. They know they're guilty. And they try with their entire lives to build up a life to cover their guilt instead of coming to Jesus. So, religious tradition... It makes people feel morally and ethically superior to those who don't do what I do. Religious tradition makes people believe that they're accepted by God by what they do. Religious tradition makes people do certain practices because they believe that's how God will accept them. I've always found it kind of comical how people say such negative things about Grace Baptist. Maybe they've only said it to me. They say such negative things. I, I, I explain grace to you every week. Grace. And grace makes people angry. Because I, I'm, I'm at full disclosure, I'm trying my dead level best to tear down every religious tradition that people trust in Grenada so that they'll turn to Christ. So that you know that's the big agenda up here. 
And that makes individuals hot. They kill Jesus. I'm not so sure they care enough to kill me. But Jesus did the same thing in Mark 7. You hear grace, you hear grace, and you hear grace when you come to Grace Baptist Church. God help us for putting Baptist in the name. But while we're showing you grace, your religious traditions can blind you from it. And the illusion of self can blind you from it. So make sure you know those two dangers. But lastly and briefly, I want to show you the greatest danger, I think, that's right here in this passage. The greatest danger is the word familiar. Familiar. If you'll notice in chapter 8, beginning in verse 14, Jesus just had this discussion about tradition with the Pharisees. Now His disciples are with Him, and it says in verse 14, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf in the boat, and He cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. By the way, the leaven of Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, is the traditions that commend you to God. Don't let that grow among you as disciples of Jesus. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said, Why are you discussing this fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive and understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes you do not see, having ears you do not hear, and you don't remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? Well, they said 12. And the seven for the 4,000? How many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? Well, they said seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? Listen carefully. Here's a danger for you and for me. The danger is that we become quite familiar with Jesus. And we begin to take Jesus for granted. In verses 17 and 18, he says, are your hearts hardened? He's talking to his twelve. He's talking to the ones who saw the feeding of the 5,000. He's talking to the ones who saw the feeding of the 4,000. The ones who saw Him walk on water. The, the ones who saw Him heal and cast out. And yet now, there's a danger among them. The danger among them is an evil, unbelieving heart. And they're familiar with Jesus. In verse 15, you... See the word leaven, the Pharisees' unbelief in Jesus was now fermenting among the disciples. Did you catch that? Please nod your head that you caught that. The Pharisees' unbelief was fermenting among the disciples. This is the power of thought. The power of doubt. The allure of others and their comments about grace. About the gospel. About the scriptures. It could be parents. It could be grandparents. It could be friends. It could be colleagues. It could be the church you used to go to. Those who are Deceived by self and believe that their tradition and their experience is commending them to God, then look at what you believe. You believe grace, the free work of Christ in his life and his death and his resurrection, the free work of Christ in ascending to heaven and praying for you from there, the free work of Christ to return to the earth and to eradicate sin and to make all things new. And they will say, Yes, but.
We believe all that, but there's no but in the gospel. It's all or none. It's either grace or not. And here among His disciples, the power of outside influences are beginning to allure them. Beloved, you must take care of your mind. You must guard, as Solomon says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart. The word heart is the Hebrew lavav. It doesn't mean what we say here in the West, our emotions, our feelings. That's not what Solomon's talking about. He's talking about the totality of the inner being. He's talking about the mind, the heart, and the will. You've got to guard that because there are plenty of people with dirty feet who want to walk through your mind. And those of us who are familiar with Christ, familiar with grace, familiar with the way that He operates. We know Him by way of creation and providence and salvation. We know who God is. We must guard our minds against those who would trample through them and cause leaven to expand. That is, their disbelief would take root. Their doubt would take root in our minds. You see, this is exactly what he says to his disciples here. He says, do you not understand the danger? Those of us who are familiar with Jesus wouldn't trust him. My God help that those of us who are familiar with Jesus wouldn't trust him. Well, how do we apply this? Let me suggest a few ways briefly so that our nursery workers don't kill me. Number one is that you need to realize something about yourself this morning so that you're not under an illusion, so that you're not deceived. Recognize this about yourself today. Recognize that you want love and acceptance. You want that. And it's natural and right For you to want it. It's the way we were made. It's the way God created us. The fall of man, however, has perverted and distorted it. And we look for love and acceptance in the wrong places. And we can find the love of God in Christ. And we can find God's acceptance in the perfect finished work of Christ. But you must first get out from under the deception, the illusion of self. And realize that you want love and acceptance. And you can find that in Christ. Here's the second application. You need to consider where you look for love and acceptance. Any place other than Christ is a functional idol. If you look for love and acceptance in your marriage, (laughs) you had not been married long enough. (laughs) Because there are some days that you wake up and you go, are we married? Why? Now, Marianne never does that. Not one time. All jokes aside. If you're looking for love and acceptance in marriage, you're going to be let down because you married a sinner. And you are a pretty good sinner too. So you can't look for it in marriage. So from where do I look? Or where do I find this love and acceptance? It's got to be above my marriage or above my children. My God, help the people who are having children right now saying this is my best friend. If my best friend was three years old, I'd go looking for new friends. No, it's your job to teach that three-year-old how to be a human. Teach that three-year-old how to be a believer. Teach that three-year-old. You're not friends until they get out and start producing. Can I get a witness? Then we'll talk about being friends. We might be real good friends when you start producing, but as long as you're consuming, we ain't friends. (laughs) 
Nowadays, that's called controlling. Did you know that? These woke children who are dead asleep. Don't control me. I ain't controlling you. That's called parenting. My, by the way, I'm not preaching at my children. They have not said this to me yet. They might today, but not yet. I'm always fearful to say something about my family because y'all start thinking, oh, they're doing that. They're really not. I promise. I'll give them credit here. If they were, I'd call them out in front of everybody, though. I'm kidding. But you need to consider. You need to consider where you're looking for love and acceptance. It's not from those children because they'll let you down. It's not from that spouse because they'll let you down. It's not from that job because that job could let you go. You have to look above these earthly things to something eternal. And His name is Jesus. And here's the last application quickly. The last application is you need to repent of those places and turn to Jesus. Here's one of the greatest lies perpetuated on the church. You want to hear it? And I'm done. One of the greatest lies perpetuated on the church is that you repent one time when you come to Jesus. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is not, by the way, repentance and belief is not the door that you enter into. Repentance and faith are the path that you walk on during the Christian life. So we're still repenting. We're repenting repenters. Because our repentance really ain't even that good either. So we can't even trust our repentance to get get us there. We've got to trust Christ. May God bless the preaching of His Word. And may God give me speedy exits so the nursery workers don't get me. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, take and seal in our hearts the truth and the treasure that You've shown us in Mark's Gospel. Grow us in grace. And make us fruitful in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.